Welcome to One More Thing. I'm Larry Bauckham here with uh, Dr. Troy Doucet, and we're talking about uh, one more thing from the weekend. So I thought this weekend was an excellent uh, handling of the Scripture. We're in the, the, the teaching called Son of Man, and we work our way through who Jesus was in his humanity. That's right. So through that, we uh, you guys have some excellent examples, but the one that I think that probably everyone is scratching their head about is the John 3.16 passage. Yeah. And I thought it was a, a great handling of that text, and uh, I have played with that a little bit myself, so I loved it because I think we're in, on the same page. But John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, whoever would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. Mm. And that uh, sets up for us who have been in evangelicalism, it sets up a, a statement of... of um, Salvation. Mm -hmm. Explain that to me from from what you knew from the past. Your past. Yeah, that that verse had always been something that was memorized. Like millions of people have memorized that verse, and it it has come to sort of constitute the salvific purposes of at least an evangelical theology, the mission of Jesus to come from heaven, to die for our sins, so that God would not send us to to, to hell. And that verse had always been taught that way. It had always been structured and, and sermonized in that way that God sends his son so we don't perish, which equated going to hell, and have eternal life, which equated going to heaven. Right. And that, that had always been the meaning of the verse for me back in the day. And, and so... But he gets his meaning a little bit from the previous passage, which you talked about this weekend, where, where Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus. That's right. Nicodemus, one of the teaching uh, guys in Judaism, probably from the Sanhedrin, more That's than right. likely. And uh, here's a guy that comes to Jesus, and he asks the question. And uh, so he asks the question, and what's the answer? So you tell me the story. Yeah, so Nick comes at night. And many theories as to why. But for me, I think the main point was being a Jewish leader and probably part of the Sanhedrin, I think he needed to be really commended for coming, to put aside his own prejudice, his his own bias that he probably had or had heard about Jesus, because Jesus at this point is under an enormous amount of scrutiny. But Nick says, I have to know. I have to come and, and find out from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so he comes under the cloak of night. And he just, he says, Jesus, these signs and these wonders that you're doing, like this can only come from a man who's been sent by God. And Jesus just doesn't even acknowledge the, the signs and wonders. He basically says, yeah, that, that's cool, but I'm here for a particular purpose, mm -hmm. transformation, the transformation of a human heart. And when you think about it in the context of who Jesus is and who, who, who Nicodemus is, Nicodemus was completely convinced that the law was God's main method for transformation of the human soul, the human mind, the human heart. And Jesus is like, no, it is love. And that's where I made the point that Jesus comes not to change God's mind, to pacify God or persuade God through some sacrifice of himself, but he comes to change our mind about who God is. And that's when Jesus says, this transformation is so powerful. It can only be described as being born again, a new birth. So let me jump in there. Yeah, yeah. So what do you mean by born again? How can a man enter his, his mother's womb when he is old? <laughs> I crawl back in. Yeah, and how's it? And here's yeah. what I love to say. It's a metaphor. That's <laughs> That's right. So for those of you who are literalists, it's it's a metaphor. That's and right. there's so many metaphors in the scripture, so many analogies and metaphors. I mean, we got to understand what it is. So the metaphor of being born again means what? What I, what I said was, again, a contentious statement was being born again doesn't mean I come to believe in Jesus. Being born again means I long to become like Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that is the equation e equation of, of the transformed heart. And Nicodemus, the, the way I said it was, he, he wasn't dissuaded by, the, by the, his desirability for it. Mm -hmm. He knew that that was God wants to transform human hearts. He was, he was challenged by the possibility of it because we know it's hard to change yourself. It's hard to change yourself when you're in your ways. 
And if and if I have an outlook that humans are already bad, like we're born bad, we're born with this sin nature, and we 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 inherit it from Adam, then we the natural structure is to create law, to create these borders, these boundaries for which to keep human behavior in check. And Jesus is like, that's not the point. The point is transformation. Right. So when he says, how can a man be born again? Can he enter his womb a second time? And Jesus says, you know, unless you're born by water and spirit. That's right. So, you know, some literalists say, well, that means you have to be born in baptism. That's right. And, but other people who are more uh, just practical or I'd say more uh, medical would say, no, you're born when the water breaks. That's you know, right. You're born, and that's a metaphor for when, you're, when you have a natural birth. That's right. When the water breaks. You're born of water. Yep. And then you're born of the spirit. But, you know, birth, you know, flesh gives birth to flesh, but, you know, the spirit, we don't know where it comes from, where it goes, blah, blah, blah. But he, he brings us this wonderful analogy. And then after that, born again, born again. Then we jump John three sixteen. John three sixteen. You know, so, and we get this. You want to? We need to be born again. Yeah. So, what does evangelical Christianity? Uh, what do they mean when they say you must be born again? I think that, f- from my experience in in un- in trying to understand that that very thick theology, it's it's to come to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, where you've come to this this cognitive sort of place of acceptance and 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 you repeat a prayer or you say a prayer asking Jesus to come into your life and that is a salvific moment mm-hmm. of being born again by the spirit mm-hmm. and again that this leads that happens through multiple ways you hear a sermon that you know resonates in your heart makes you realize that you are a sinner some of the bad things you've done in your life bad decisions and here's a way out, like here's a way to be forgiven. So of course I'm gonna respond. And so that's where I talked about three ways of salvation mm-hmm. that I think are, are really faulty. The first one, it's like salvation by transaction. Right. Then I said, there's salvation by association. Well, my parents were mm-hmm. believers or whatever. And then the last one was salvation by manipulation where I, I'm coerced to feel bad about something I know is wrong. And so I'm, I'm made to feel guilty and shameful. So I respond through manipulative, you know, teaching that makes me scared in some way. But isn't it interesting that the church slash whatever church has created this uh, theology of salvation? Do this, do this, do this, whether it's manipulation or transaction or whatever. Mm-hmm. But when Jesus confronts Nicodemus, he doesn't really say, Nicodemus, you need to believe on me. You need to confess your sins and believe with all your heart right. that I'm a son of God. That's and right. you'll find your place in heaven. That's he, right. He never, he never says that to anyone. That's right. But this theology is created out of, out of that. So I think at Suncoast we're looking for something more whole, yep. more cohesive. What did Jesus mean when he talks about the kingdom of heaven? What does he mean when he says, hey, you really need to be born again? If, if I were to say... Troy, you really need to be born again in what Jesus really meant. Mm-hmm. What do you think he meant by that by that metaphor? I think the way I take it is to be born again means to have some sort of event, right? Some sort of not it's not a transactional event or anything like that, but there's some sort of awakening and mm-hmm. awareness that is brought to my mind through some experience. And that experience, for me, if if it, if God's involved, it doesn't have to entail a church experience. Right. It could be at a beach. It could right. be at a birth of my a child. It could be anywhere. This is why Jesus says, the wind blows where it will. Right. And we don't know when this rebirth happens. There, there's no marker. There's no demarcation. Like, I still have my certificate of salvation from June 14, 1986, at Vacation Bible School. And I get it. We humans love to demarcate things in our life, birthdays, anniversaries, whatever. But Jesus is pretty clear to say... It happens when it happens right. that I come to this awareness of God loves me exactly as I am. And there is nothing I need to do to pacify God. There's nothing I need to do to persuade God. And it's when we become awakened to that reality that we are God's kid and that he loves us. And there's nothing I could do to change that love that has the power, the potential to give me this new outlook on life, this new beginning. Yeah. And so that's, that's, it's as simple as that. Yeah. I, 
I think you need to think in different ways. And when our paradigm has shifted and we begin to see that I'm not a dirty, rotten sinner, yeah. but like you said, I am a child of God who God loves me, yeah. then my my mind sees new insights, which is the analogy, I'm born again, yeah. or I see through a different lens. I let the old viewpoint go away, yeah. these these faulty three premises you just stated so well, I let those go. Yep. And I begin to see through new insights and new life. But but I thought it was, you handled this, the passage masterfully. Thank Your you. communication skills are tremendous. And I really just want to let you know for me, you know, I appreciate having someone that when I'm not there, step up and just knock the ball out of the park. And yeah. you do that repeatedly. And uh, their community is, is loving you and embracing you. And they, they love the fact that, uh, you know, Maybe this is a little different than what I grew up with. Yeah. But this resonates. So a couple of things to our listeners today. Number one, if you haven't seen the movie, The Jesus Revolution, yeah. you need to go see it. It's really a great movie that needs to be seen. It's about the, the hippies in the 60s and the spiritual awakening and how it infiltrated the church and for four or five years had a huge impact. Mm-hmm. The second thing I think is worth watching is, is the series on Angel Studios, no, a streaming app. It's called The Chosen. Mm-hmm. And it's a really an excellent series about the life of Jesus. And one of the my favorites is the scene of Nicodemus in The Chosen. Yeah, yeah. This guy comes in, he's honest. Here's a top academic going, Wow, nobody can do these things. There's something here. And I and he I'm paying respect to you, Jesus, by coming to you. And I really have my question how this is such a different mindset for me. I just can't grasp that's this right. doesn't make sense. And Jesus saying, well, you got to change your mind. That's right. You got to let some of those old paradigms go and let the new paradigm begin. Yeah. So I, I think I loved it. I think our, our community loved it. Yeah. And I challenge people, if you've not watched it, go back and watch this week. It's uh, Son of Man number three. Yeah. And uh, they'll be blessed if they do. And this week, Son of Man number four. Yep. We're going to be on stage together. Yeah. Dynamic duo again. Ooh, we'll see how that goes. It Can't should wait. be fun. And uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Bob. Thank you.